Okay, thank you so much everyone for waiting uh, in this room. We'll move on to the next session on an investor roundtable on, on sort of leveraging blended finance, specifically in education and skilling, and perhaps even beyond that. Uh, we do have a couple of new participants. We will have one more participant from British Asian Trust joining us shortly, uh, but we should get started. And Karthik, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much, Karen. And uh, once again, thank you to the Nudge Foundation for facilitating this uh, session. And thank you to our three panelists. Uh, welcome, Prachi. Welcome, Dan. And Abha will be joining us shortly. Uh, so I'll just uh, jump right in and you know, set, set the context. Uh, we've spoken a little bit about uh, what blended finance is, but uh, what we really wanted to say was that why is blended finance important? You know, this is really an, uh, a tool and in an industry which is at an inflection point in terms of its increasing adoption, both by NGOs and funders and philanthropists. As we saw, there's 185 of these instruments globally, 17 in emerging markets, three in India, but most importantly, more than a dozen under development. Uh, so there's definitely this incredible potential to scale up and address, uh, you know, development challenges and, and uh, potentially specific challenges, you know, raised by, uh, by COVID, by the lockdown and by all of the implications of, uh, you know, what this new normal has created. So what we were wanting to do in this session is to focus with, uh, you know, uh, these three individuals and organizations who are the the leaders and the pioneers in really having brought the sector this far uh, and specifically look at the area of education and skilling, which is a, which is a major, you know, sort of uh, a, a, a critically important development area. And again, post COVID becomes supremely important, right? You've seen students being out of school. So there's this uh, whole notion of having to study from home. Uh, lower income students uh, necessarily would be more disadvantaged in that sort of a scenario. How do you even go back to school? Learning outcomes are falling behind. So there's a lot of issues in education uh, and a lot of opportunities potentially. And then of course in skilling, uh, already we've seen massive amounts of job losses across segments. Of course in the blue collar segments, but also in the white collar segment. Uh, skilling has always been a, a, a challenging thing, uh, you know, to, to appropriately identify, train, place and retain someone in a meaningful job, which, is, uh, which pays them well, uh, which, which gives them a dignity of life and where they actually, uh, which they actually aspire to. So in these two critical sectors, we would like to understand, uh, you know, what are the major lessons from blended finance uh, and where's the market likely to go? Uh, you know, so I wanted to just uh, potentially frame four large challenges which the sector faces. And then I'll introduce each of the speakers and I would request each of them, you know, to share both what their organization has been doing, uh, the insights from their experiences working on dips, uh, and their views on you know, uh, how best blended finance can play a role going forward using specific examples. So those four sort of key issues are, you know, one is obviously unlocking outcome funding and risk capital. How do we get more investors uh, aboard? Second is obviously around metrics, right? And uh, how do you metricize and price outcomes and standardize things? Uh, the third issue is around the lowering of transaction costs and building the depth in the market. How do we create more and more impact bonds? And of course, we've not spoken about this too much so far, but getting, the fourth issue is around getting the buy-in from the government and really trying to see how you can unlock you know, more capital to make it CSR ready. Uh, so with each of these uh, folks, we'll focus on something uh, slightly different. Uh, first, let me just go through and quickly do a round of introductions. Uh, so our first panelist uh, will be Prachi. Uh, Prachi is the director uh, at the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation in India, which has dedicated itself as a foundation to focusing on the uh, issue of transforming the lives of children, specifically children in urban poverty through better education and economic stability. They're currently working with, I think, over 12 million beneficiaries. And Prachi is on the board of many of their main investees and advisory committees to the state governments and education departments. Uh, previously, she has worked at the Boston Consulting Group and also in the telecom sector in the U.S. Uh, and she's an alumni of IIT Delhi and uh, uh, UCLA and University of Chicago. So welcome, uh, Prachi. Uh, secondly, we'll hear from uh, Dhan. Uh, Dhan is the head of social finance and the India head at the UBS Optimus Foundation, uh, which is probably the most uh, largest and most important risk investor in not just this education, but most of the divs so far. 
Uh, Dhan has had a background in programs and in fact uh, management. Uh, before UBS, she used to work with Hand in Hand, Switzerland, uh, where she was a chief operating officer. Uh, and before this, she was a CEO of a fantastic NGO uh, uh, that many of you may be familiar with called Apnale, which focuses on healthcare and education in Mumbai and is doing fantastic work right now, uh, as we've seen uh, in the COVID situation. Uh, and she's also worked at Give India, GuideStar, and is a veteran uh, you know, of this uh, development sector. So, so uh, welcome, Dhan. Great to have you here. Uh, and our third speaker is going to be Abha, who will be short, shortly joining us. She's just in a previous session. Abha is the executive director of the British Asian Trust. Uh, she has uh, been a founding member of the British Asian Trust, uh, which has launched this 11 million quality education in India DIB, where the Dell Foundation and UBS have also been involved. Uh, and she's also a fellow at the Government Outcomes Lab at the, at the Blavatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford, and has, and, and has been a thought leader in how different approaches to finance and grant making can be applied uh, in development finance. So with a quick introduction to our speakers, I will now sort of hand it over to each of them, uh, starting first with Prachi. Uh, so Prachi, uh, what uh, we'd love for you to sort of talk mm -hmm. about what Dell Foundation has done, the fantastic experience that you guys have here, with a focus on basically two issues. One, given all of your experience in education, what are the models which are the most relevant in your, in your opinion? And if you can talk about the different financial structures that you have been involved in, uh, which, you know, including Vartana, the multi-provider DIB, uh, the impact-linked debt, and other plans that you have. So over to you, Prachi. Thank you very much. Thanks, Karthik. Thanks, Aparna, for setting it up so well. And I think in that master class and the setup that you've done, uh, you've answered one of the questions that what will it take for more such instruments to happen, uh, widespread education and, uh, and you know, more and more of us understanding uh, not just the nuances of them, but also the simplicity of them uh, is, uh, is, you know, is what really is needed. And uh, Asha Impact is doing an outstanding job in terms, of, uh, in terms of making that more mainstream. So coming to the foundation, we've done several of these um, performance-linked financing programs, as I would call them. And we started with uh, two objectives. The first objective is for us to do performance-linked financing uh, as an option is to scale impact, you know, can, you know, something which is proven, which is giving the outcomes and the results can we actually scale it. So that's the, uh, that's the objective number one. And the second objective is how can we actually crowd in more funding? How can we more collaborative in the sectors and uh, specific subject subsectors in which we are working? And when I say collaborative, I mean, um, much more than just crowding in funding a large part of the collaboration is also standardizing those metrics and also getting a larger pool of uh, outcome of funders agreeing on the same set of metrics and working towards a common uh, towards a common outcome so those have been our two primary objectives for engaging in these uh, it's a fast growing area of work for us over the last 3 years we have structured now more than um, for five such instruments. Uh, some we have done much more as pilots and you know, the others uh, we've been able to scale uh, in collaboration with uh, other partners and two of them are here today. Um, so you know, thanks Aparna. We have uh, uh, experimented with several pay for performance funding mechanisms. A few of them I will quickly share some outcomes and results on. You know, the ones I've shown on the slide are all in the area of education. And, uh, and we tried, you know, a three pronged strategy over there. We had a certain set of interventions, which is row number one and row number two over here, uh, where we wanted to improve learning outcomes in budget private schools. These are low cost private schools across India. And uh, while these schools are, um, are paid schools, poor people are uh, sending, are paying fees to be on these uh, in these schools, their outcomes have typically not been very high. And so we did two pilots, performance link pilots over here, where we, uh, where we gave incentives to schools to see if with those financial incentives, the outcomes uh, of children studying in these schools can improve. So those are two that we did much more as pilots, and I'll show the results of one of them. 
Um, the other one is the other big area of work and someone in the master class was asking about how social enterprises and NGOs can participate in it. It was very much structured around how can they actually scale uh, impact and you know uh, scale organizations which have deep impact in education. So this uh, the quality education India, the development impact bond which we are partnering with UBS and British Asian Trust for is much more an intervention in that direction where we've taken a certain set of proven interventions, put them in a development impact bond structure and you know are scaling them in several schools. And the objective in all of them, like we said, you know, I'm right now talking only about the education sector has been to improve learning outcomes of students. If you can go to the next slide, Aparna. Very quickly now sharing the structure of one of them, which is the performance link financing for affordable private schools that I was talking about. Here in the, you know, the, the model that we've put together is that we have come in with debt funding for school financing company. Vartana is one such school financing company which provides debt to low fee schools. Typically, the schools use this debt to um, improve infrastructure of these schools. And we wanted to shift that towards deploying towards improvement of quality in schools. So this is the objective with which the debt has been given to Vartana. And the performance linked structuring part of it, Vartana gives that debt to schools with a program on top that if the schools improve their learning outcomes, then the interest rate is reduced for the schools which are improving the learning outcomes. And that reduction is subsidized by us in the interest rate in which we have given the loan to Vartana. So this is, you know, we are working on both sides of this uh, dip, if you were to call it, both on the risk as well as the outcome side of it. And throughout the process, we have um, an independent evaluator who will come and do baseline, midline assessments for the schools to ensure that the learning outcomes have in fact improved. So these are, um, if you move to the next slide, please. So these are, uh, you know, very quick results on, on what we found. We found uh, that, you know, the achievements are actually outstanding. We, um, we found that we ran this in two cohorts of uh, 130 schools approximately each. And we found that approximately 74%, three fourths of the schools actually achieved the target, which is huge. And how these targets have been defined is that we got the independent evaluator to come and assess that how much do kids usually learn through a school year and the targets are over and above that. So it, it's, uh, it's, it's, an, it's an outcome which is over and above what they would have achieved. So over, over a period of two years, we found that you know, schools have achieved as much as 25 points of uh, improvement on their baseline, which is, which is what we are learning across different instruments that we are finding, that not only a large number uh, that these incentives work and a large number of um, service providers are actually meeting the targets, but what we are also finding, and Abha and uh, Dhan will talk a bit more about it, that it actually deepens the impact. You know, we are, get, we are getting higher outcomes than what we've seen in a non-incentive linked structure and which is hugely exciting for us as, uh, as outcome funders. So this is one example where we could structure our debt very much linked to uh, how uh, to outcomes and improving outcomes at scale. The second structure as described in the next slide is um, is a much more uh, complex one, but nevertheless a fun one when you have good partners. Uh, so this is uh, this has this is this is a very typical DIB structure. It is a development impact bond where Michael and Susan Dell Foundation is the outcome funder. UBS is the risk investor. We've commonly selected a set of service providers, which are very well-known NGOs in India, had a very good proven track record of uh, improving learning outcomes of students. This is now being measured by Cream Matters India and uh, you know, based on them achieving these targets. And as we are finding over achieving these targets, payments are made and uh, risk investor gets both its principal as well as its, uh, an interest rate on top of that principal. Um, we have also used similar instruments, Aparna, if you could move to the next slide. Uh, we have also used this concept of impact-linked debt to achieve 
broader objectives. For example, we gave a debt to a, com a skilling, com skilling financing company called Eduvance, which provides uh, loans to students for, uh, uh, for doing skilling courses. But you know, before we came in, the, the kind of students who were coming there were from slightly more, uh, you know, they were not from the target segment that we truly care, uh, we are trying to impact, which is uh, families of less than 25,000 rupees monthly household income. The, the loans were much more for higher end uh, uh, programs and you know, slightly more affluent students. So we gave them a very specific debt facility through where we said that you know, the, this debt facility at a, at a standard uh, interest rate, which is a lower interest rate than what they can get in the market, can be deployed. And through that, we've tried to get uh, you know, them to extend their product in a segment which is riskier because of the higher risk of NPAs in that segment. But, you know, we are taking that risk, absorbing that risk for them and creating another model, which hopefully, you know, both of these are the Vartana and Edubans are very much like pilots to prove the point that, you know, these instruments can work. And um, so far, actually, they have not only been able to deploy the entire facility uh, the, the debt facility that was given to them for students coming from uh, low income families, but actually have very low NPA on, uh, on, on these loans. So, so, you know, this is, uh, you know, these two pilots, three pilots, uh, DIB is no longer a pilot. Just to quickly show that, you know, this is no longer a very esoteric concept. This can be done. It is more complex to structure, but at the same time, the outcomes that can be achieved are, are higher, not just the same, are higher. And, you know, Creates, uh, creates a discipline and creates a scale, which is probably not achievable through direct financing. Um, maybe I can just quickly flip the next slide through Aparna and move to my final slide, uh, which is that, you know, where are we going from there, as Karthik asked. So we are looking upon these as, uh, you know, as instruments through which we can impact not just the education sector, but many other sectors. So the DIB, like I said, is achieving outcomes and is achieving deeper outcomes than what we were getting in a non-DIB structure. So we definitely want to scale instruments like that and hopefully scale them now in partnership with the government and have social impact bonds. Um, Vartana and ISFC, the school financing companies that pilots that we've done, they were much more pilots where we were the only funder. And these now we are looking at uh, putting through larger fund-like structures. Kaizen is one of the partners and they're speaking tomorrow through the conference, uh, who is looking at extending similar pilots and similar instruments to a much larger set of financial intermediaries. And we are also looking at exploring such pay for performance models for other sectors like skilling and jobs. And uh, as we talk, there is, a, there is an advanced conversation which is going on with the National Skill Development Con Cor uh, Corporation to put together such an instrument. So there is a lot of scope in where we can take it from here. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Prachi. You know, it's, it's just fantastic to, to, to see the range of uh, what you guys have worked on. And, uh, you know, the classic dip, obviously, you know, is, is, is something that uh, is very interesting. But equally interesting is the impact linked debt. And the, and the fact that, you know, this can be applied, as your examples show, either to the intermediary, which is what Varthana is. Varthana is an NBFC that lends to the schools so they can build infrastructure, or it can be lent to the individual end user, as you guys are doing yes. through Edubans, which is yes. the student or the family uh, that needs to pay for the education. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and look, and we see education and skilling as sort of part of a curriculum. So it makes a lot of sense that uh, uh, as part of the spectrum, so it makes a lot of sense to, to be looking at skilling going forward. Uh, could you just share a thought, Prachi? I mean, sorry to ask you this put you on the spot, but specifically to COVID, you know, and the challenge of education and skilling, uh, the, the, the relevance of blended finance. Uh, huge, huge, uh, Karthik, because, you know, what the advantage, uh, and I see Abha smiling over there because she's, uh, she'll probably, you know, talk a little bit more about uh, what they are thinking of in structuring some of these instruments in the wake of COVID, but you know the relevance has increased even more because you know you are you, you want to now in the face of the pandemic, in the face of a crisis, really maximize the efficacy of 
every single philanthropic dollar which is going out there. So there has been interest from the government in these, uh, you know, I can be rolled them out sooner. There has been interest from more and more philanthropic or organizations to collaborate. And, you know, the, the, the objectives can always be different. The objective for one stakeholder can be to crowd in funding, but the objective for other can be, can we get deeper impact? Can we actually ensure that we, we get, you know, the deep impact that we want? So, you know, there are different motivations, but the relevance at this time is very high. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Prashi. Uh, and we'll, we'll come to Abba soon. And, you know, and I'm really keen to learn more about the sling piece for sure. Uh, but uh, before that, uh, we'd love to hear from Dhun. Hi, hi Dhun. Uh, uh, specifically, the perspective of, you know, risk capital. You guys have been involved in, I think, so many different impact bonds. Uh, so, we are also risk capital as Asha Impact, and we're now examining, evaluating whether uh, we should invest in some of these bonds. So, could, so, so we'd love to hear your perspective on how you have uh, gone about this. And a couple of specific questions that you could focus on, you know, which is what is the current investor sentiment uh, amongst investors globally, h and institutions, after all of this erosion in wealth that has happened, right? What appetite is there for deploying additional risk capital? Uh, and, you know, are investors looking at this from their philanthropic buckets or their commercial buckets? How are global investors looking at blended finance in India? And the final issue that comes up is this force majeure risk, right? That which COVID itself is one. That how do you price in these kind of risks and so on? So we'd love to hear from you, Dan, and all that UBS Optimus is doing and overall the perspective of risk capital in this industry. Um, and thanks, Prashi, for those um, insights and for sharing those examples. Um, I will get to your questions, Karthik, and I think these are more of the, the technical ones, but maybe what I will do is start off with maybe broader thoughts yeah. on you know, what, what is needed in the education and skilling sector, and particularly in light of, of COVID now, um, how blended finance, social finance can play a role, and then how do we also look at going the market um, more broadly, more widely. Uh, but maybe can you speak a little bit louder than that? Sorry, this, it's the oh. audio is a bit more. Is that better now? Yes, I see that. Uh, so I'll start off by telling you a little bit about the UBS Optimus Foundation, which is uh, basically a client-facing foundation within UBS that is the world's uh, largest private wealth manager. Now, the funds that we apply to the Optimus Foundation um, are uh, from UBS, its employees, and uh, UBS's clients, so mainly ultra and high net worth individuals um, that bank with UBS. Um, so this puts us as a foundation in, a, in an interesting and unique position um, and really frames one of our key objectives, which is to bring more and better funding for development programs. Uh, and particularly to provide uh, catalytic funding to drive innovation and impact. So we target the last mile and bottom of the pyramid users and are very much focused on maximizing impact first, even as uh, investors. Um, so now just a little bit about our social finance work. We look at three key um, areas in social finance. The first being building the ecosystem for outcomes-based financing and blended finance through uh, knowledge exchange, uh, creating platforms and providing grant funding where needed. Second area is testing uh, new instruments and delivery models. And that's really where uh, in the past and, and currently we provide risk investment to a number of outcomes contracts, uh, including for impact bonds um, in India and South Africa as well. And a number of others in pre-launch um, phase. Uh, a social success note, Karthik, you talked earlier about social success note, social success note in Uganda, and also um, look at making direct investments into social enterprises. And then the third area that we look at, so once these instruments are, are tested or we've proven de delivery models, looking at leveraging synergies to take these models to scale, um, such as looking at work where we are pooling uh, risk investment through a UBS social impact fund or designing a primary health outcomes fund uh, targeted in Africa or looking at an education financing facility in Africa as well. So all of these are at scale and then in partnership. Um, so with that context, in terms of who we uh, are as an organization, um, I, I'll start 
start off with maybe some reflections on you know kind of what's happening in education what are we seeing through the education uh, impact on the in india um, and other education programs also in india and globally uh, uh, hi, Den. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of sorry to interrupt. This is Sriram here. Uh, I think a lot of people feel that the volume is a little low. Maybe if that's the best you can, then that's all right. But uh, if you could perhaps come closer. I'll speak louder. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I'll try and speak louder. <clears throat> so just coming to then the impact on education and skilling and in light of COVID, what we're seeing is um, I guess, or what is the need that, that, that we see is certainly in the mid to long term talking about uh, education sector resilience and then how blended finance can play a role there. And, um, but more uh, immediate short term need being program delivery modifications, looking at what needs to be done during social distancing and lockdown, for example, and then what changes in delivery will be required post lockdown uh, really to help children uh, catch up once schools start. Um, and, and in that, what we're seeing is a lot of innovation around remote and distance learning solutions. And we think that this will play an important role, particularly in maintaining learning continuity for children. Um, but we, with the caveat or with the understanding that learning outcomes particularly for lowest income families, will not be the same uh, as in regular classroom delivery or as, in, as we're seeing in high income countries or, or with high income schools. But remote solutions will, will help with the continuity and also with some social emotional and psychological resilience that will help children when they do come back to school. So it's, it's important nonetheless. But what I feel is, is key here is also to look at frugal innovation in that sense. So what are the remote solutions that will effectively reach the children uh, with limited and poor access? And, uh, and so that will be key. Uh, now, given the magnitude of the, uh, the pandemic's impact on systems, on funding, on organizations, and then, of course, at a child level, um, the challenges we are facing in the sector are even more severe than before. And that's where pay for performance can provide a pathway for recovery for the sector. So one, some of the things that we see or the characteristics within these pay for performance mechanisms uh, through examples um, like the education dip in India or, or others um, is that flexibility and program deli delivery that's really enabling them uh, uh, to uh, enabling the in implementers to make the, the program modifications and continue to work towards achieving goals um, on um, uh, with, with flexible funding. And what has also been very encouraging has been the positive response and collective responsibility by funders. And many of these structures actually force funders to come together. And I think by virtue of, of that funder relationship, there has been a binded commitment to, uh, to program goals and, and also commitment to work together to find solutions. Uh, so really encouraging things coming out of the sector. Uh, but more broadly, you know, how do we, uh, how do we use blended finance to kind of catalyze a philanthropy in a sort of COVID and post COVID scenario? Um, you know, what we're seeing right now is a lot of funding being repurposed for emergency relief efforts, um, mm. pressure on government's philanthropy uh, to fund locally and take a sort of first things first approach. Uh, and, and, and also a funding tsunami as we usually see with in emergency situations, which all basically means that strong grassroots organizations that are delivering learning outcomes could uh, eventually run out of funding sources. And so the question is, how do we meet short-term funding requirements uh, and yet avoid a hitch to development initiatives that might later come? Uh, and so while currently there are some short-term challenges, I think there is a huge opportunity for, uh, and now more than ever, for a paradigm shift in how philanthropy and then um, public spending can drive development outcomes. So while funding pots are being um, um, used towards emergency um, response currently, in time, funding will start to dry up and funders will become more discerning in how and where they apply their resources. Um, and that is where we will need to see more effective philanthropy 
and that is where outcome based funding can come in because uh, it has the ability to catalyze the systems focus and to drive um, uh, the uh, resu results focus in, in um, philanthropic and public spending and due to two key features. The first being uh, because of the nature of pay for results, it shifts payment timings. And so funders who are strained now can pay later for results. And secondly, it can bring in different kinds of funders with different risk return profiles and different funding appetites at, at a time like this. Um, so this timing gap could be interesting and can be funded by investors who also might be interested in market opportunities uh, or uh, that are uncorrelated to financial uh, markets. Um, so now the key will really be, I think, scale. And it will become important to think about uh, how do we look at these solutions at scale uh, in order to, to build and grow the market. So Karthi, coming to also your, your question uh, around, you know, how do we do that? How do we grow the market and what is what are sort of things to focus on? One of the um, initiatives that we supported at a global level is, is the Impact Bond Working Group. And I thought I'd share a few insights from, from convenings on, that, on this very topic. Um, and uh, so the Impact Bond Working Group is, is co-led by us along with the Swiss SECO and UK's DFID. And it convenes key bilateral and multilateral donors to basically uh, look at what are the paths to scale for outcomes funding and how do we grow this market. And so the key areas or three key areas that have emerged from that piece of work have been to grow the market, we need to look at knowledge exchange, setting up uh, a knowledge hub, and uh, and what the impact on working group, group has, has supported is, is work by Oxford uh, through the government outcomes lab, uh, looking at outcomes acceleration. So really, how do you support new impact bonds and uh, better quality impact bonds uh, through grant um, design grants, technical assistance grants, uh, and thirdly, looking at pooling of Funding. So both at the outcomes level as well as um, so both at the outcome funding level as well as the uh, risk investment levels. So with outcome funding, we've seen big announcements like the World Bank and DFID uh, with over uh, $300 uh, million dollars announced. Um, and on pooling risk investment, uh, uh, we've initiated um, within UBS and with, between the, in partnership between the Optimus Foundation and our colleagues within UBS, uh, the setting up of a social impact fund, uh, which will actually make impact first risk investment more appealing for the more mainstream investors. So coming a little bit Karthik to your question in terms of who are the investors who who, who, who actually support programs like this. And through this blended risk investment um, stack, we really believe that, the, uh, you know, so we're looking at a tiered basically capital stack with philanthropic funding coming in to cushion the more senior tranches of investment and, uh, and, um, and, and doing that in, in collaboration with the bank uh, platform. Uh, so, 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 you know, I think overall looking at really knowledge sharing, making sure that NGOs, intermediaries are capacitated to participate in a market like this, and then looking at uh, pooling funding at scale. Uh, I think those are the three key areas that we need to look at going forward. Great. Yeah. Wonderful. No, thank you. Thank you, then, for that uh, comprehensive overview and perspective. Uh, and so many issues there to pick, to pick up on. And we'll come back to that in the, in the Q&A. Uh, hi, hi, Abhag. Uh, great, great to have you with us. Uh, uh, I, I've given you intro actually at the beginning of the panel, but just 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 to quickly let everyone know, the British Asia Trust is a uh, is a not for profit, and uh, you know uh, working with a lot of major donors uh, who are British Ind Indians uh, and British Asians. Uh, so I guess a question for you, Abha, is you know there's many things that the British Asian Trust could have done. Uh, so maybe going a little bit back to first principles, why develop an impact bonds? What has been your experience of them? Uh, needless to say, you guys are you know involved in the different dibs which have been there in the market, and and what do you see as the role for the dibs in the post-COVID world? Thank you, Karthik, and uh, very good to see my friends uh, on the panel as well. We uh, we were together early morning, I think six o'clock UK time. Uh, they've gotten used to seeing me in my pajamas regularly. So as uh, collaborative funders, the one thing you get to know is the insides of their houses and their minds uh, very very early morning and when not to catch them on the wrong side. So collaborative funding has many advantages, 
and in uh, in a covid situation i would say the top advantage is you you really do get to know your your partners um and you work together so thank you for having me um i will answer the first question i'll do it in three things uh, what, why did we decide to do this and we could be doing a lot of other stuff uh, what did we learn and what are we doing now um and i'll try and answer on all those three things i'll try and bring a covid piece on it um so sort of three years ago we started exploring uh, this space and i'll be honest we didn't start by saying we want to do blended finance now let's find the book and let's read it and let's start doing it tomorrow we started by saying that we uh, have always worked in philanthropy we've always used grant as a tool but grant works with the premise that here's a great idea let's put some money in it and let's see if it works is there a different premise we could start with could we start with the premise that we know the outcome that we want to have and can we actually put funding into it and can we then see whether funding itself can change the way actors behave so the behavior of all the actors around the table was what i was really excited about um and uh, we went to our friends at the optimus foundation who were who done educate girls and we said right what do we do together and they said something big and i said what is big look like and they said nothing under 10 million and of course you had to work with the msdf foundation at that point so they were the people who came right after that and as three partners we designed and co-designed the education thing that's our starting point what can we do that doesn't fund just a good idea but funds a result and an impact and also is so focused mm -hmm. on that that if it did not achieve we don't put money in that's our thing now we got 3 years in this space right we worked with our partners we designed we've launched we fought we've uh, collaborated we've implemented we've had good results we've questioned our results we've questioned our targets in some cases uh, we've questioned our models we've questioned just about everything as we work together which is what early adopters do uh, and and the analogy i'll use here for you karthik and aparna is the one of uh, iphone a person who who uses around a block and gets a new iphone actually is the one who's dealing with the bugs so we are as a group of people the the bug users you know so we've got the bugs we've learned from the bugs and we are so i'll give you some examples of what that means so in the beginning uh, the criticism of impact bonds and i'm sure it's the same now and i'm waiting for those questions to come it costs a lot uh, transaction costs so some of the real bug fixtures that we're trying to do as a sector Dhan referred to is how do you quicken the pace? How do you get better technical assistance in? So it's faster, quicker. You get the legals done. We're working with the folks like Aparna on how legals can be solved from different kinds of financing coming in. So really making sure that those learnings that we have go into the sector. So that's the first thing that we're really doing. Take the bugs, catch them, make sure that you don't have to wait on your iPhone for a photograph to load. That's one. Second. we believe that the basic premise of an impact bond right where you have collaborative funding you focus on outcomes and not on inputs um, it's flexible all that's brilliant but i just don't think it's a textbook that you can follow on that depending on the context and depending on the social problem you're trying to solve you've got to vary it that's our biggest lesson again i'll use an analogy because i'm uh, it's lunch time here uh, it's like getting a recipe from your mother on whatsapp right she'll give you a recipe there's nothing exact but it tastes brilliant uh, you follow a book it doesn't taste as good So I suggest that actually the way you approach an impact bond is akin to that recipe on WhatsApp. You say, right? How do I solve my problem? What do I know from my programmatic work or my grant work, and how do I apply it to this? You don't take a technique and then put it into that because it doesn't work. And there could be many things you solve in the recipe. Who is the risk investor in a post-COVID world? I would say governments could be risk investors because governments got to take risk. Private sector may be bleeding at this time. You could say service providers might take on some of their own risk and change the way the paradigm works. you might say that the outcome could be played paid for by somebody very different in this context so what you do is you take the recipe and you design for what the problem is you don't start with by saying this is the recipe i want to apply to this problem uh, it won't work so that's my second sort of big input at lunch time as i'm waiting for my food to come uh, and the third piece is about covid and leapfrogging i don't i think what covid's done for people like us who are sort of like champions and pioneers of this piece as as a group of us is to say how do you leapfrog some of the problems we were having in getting people to adopt them especially governments we find that the one thing is really really helped us is to leapfrog and say right let's jump we need flexible funding you need to pivot your model to distance and trade and digital models find here some flexible funding the outcome is all agreed up front and let's see how you're going to do it and let's determine how risk transfer is going to work So that's just three bits of learning. Uh, on the QE, I did. I didn't hear my partners uh, speak about the results in detail, but so I'll speak a little bit about the why behind the results. The good results are great, um, and uh, again, an analogy here. Uh, it's like being a parent, right? You get this amazing report card from your your your, your child, and you say, oh, "This is incredible. 
you know, am I an amazing parent or is it because my child is a genius? And the group's sort of there right now. They're going almost, you know, what's going on over here? Or what's, what's endemic to our providers? Or what's the, are we the great, you know, parents in this piece? Or is the div doing it? And I think the answer in all cases, as it is with our children, it is a combination of things. We do have brilliant providers, but brilliant providers provided with the right nurturing environment take their results and absolutely kill it. And that's what we're starting to see. And while we can bottle that up and you know, give you a tonic of the, how do you do it for other providers? We hope we can do that with a lot of providers in the coming months. We have an outcome readiness program kicking off. We really genuinely would say that it is about the combination of that nature and nurture piece within the div. That focus on performance management where someone's holding your hand. That ability to give somebody the data in the classroom that GMI gives and allows the, teach, the, the providers to use that data flexibly and to understand what they change. Finance not being about a log frame about how many trainings you provided, but finance being about what can you do with this money to make your impact happen. Those are the reasons. That's the sort of nurture bit of all of this. And of course, there are these great providers that would never take away credit from what they've been doing. And that's incredible. So the question on, you asked me about how do you grow the market? I think for me, there are three actors who need to work together on this. There's government. Outcomes, social outcomes, the ultimate buyer of any social outcome in any country is a government. They are increasingly turning to us and asking us to come in and say, right, what can we do together with you? How can we really drive outcomes with society and with other collaborators? So we really believe government capability building is a top priority for PA. The second is the lack of data. Uh, out, the minute you start talking outcomes, uh, and if we didn't have MSDF around uh, the education dip, you know, how do you measure something? They put GMI on the table and said, right, here's a measurement framework you can use. We're looking at skilling now, and we've been in calls just over the last few weeks. The first question is what data should we be using? What is that measurement? And it doesn't exist. We need to invest. In that. And the third is, of course, our providers, really getting them ready. And that's a combination, again, of good systematic data usage and attitude. I have to be honest, the best data people may not make the best DIB partners because they may not have the attitude to adapt and learn as they do it. I don't know if I've answered all your questions. I have a bunch of more stuff, but I'd rather have a Q&A and get to what people want to hear than bang on about the backbones. No, no, that's very well put, Baba. Thanks for, for you know, tackling that question of um, how, how did we get there. And I, and I wanted to mention tomorrow, Aparna and uh, Sanchi from our team are leading a workshop along with folks like ID Inside, Dahlberg and all, specifically on this issue, which mm -hmm. is uh, how do you make an NGO dippable? Uh, and the issue of data, performance management, and capacity. That really has to be the focus. Uh, and today we were trying to focus more on, you know, the, the fundraising uh, funders' perspectives and the intermediaries' perspectives. So we have a lot of questions. Uh, I think if I can also add that at uh, 6 p.m. tomorrow, we are also co-hosting another session where we will go into the details and results of a lot of education pilots that I spoke about. So some of the folks who are specifically interested in blended finance for education can also tune into that session. Um, Prachi, I know you have to leave. So if you have maybe two minutes, um, I think there's a question that maybe you could answer before you leave. Um, that's how do you really ensure the long-term um, sustainability, right? So how does the program really outlive the intervention? Or how does the outcomes outlive the intervention? Uh, because in the three years or four years of the day, everyone's kind of focusing with performance management, et cetera, to make sure that the outcomes are achieved. What happens after that? Yeah. So that's a great question. And I would say it's an unanswered question. It's a, it's a topic that we deliberate upon with all our partners and not just in the context of uh, Deb Aparna, I would say, you know, we, we debate on that question in the context of all the work that we do, right? That hearing comes in the funder with the funding, with a, you know, high powered service provider, you get, you, you know, you get the magic, you get the impact, but you know, how does that, you know, impact sustains beyond uh, beyond them. So one, I would say that, you know, I wouldn't worry that as my top question, given where we are starting and how low our starting point is, it's not my top worry. Uh, you know, if we can get impact and we can get impact at scale, you know, that in itself is an achievement to celebrate uh, for a few years to come than to say, okay, how do I actually, you know, move on from here and hop on to another setting. So, so that is one. The second is, I think it will, you know, most of the education interventions that we are working in, uh, we are working with the government. And therein, I would say the critical thing for the outcomes to sustain is that some fundamental shift comes about in the government education systems, right? We should, uh, we should be moving away from the system of 
service providers or NGOs coming and fixing what is broken within a, a larger system. And we at Michael and Susan Dell Foundation have a large volume of work, which is just fixing our basic education systems as well. The third, which I think is a much more near term, uh, short term objective that most of us has, uh, as uh, you know, participants in this conversation have, that how can we actually structure more and more of social impact bonds? Because that seems to me the next step where you know, public provisioning of money, which is already happening, can be made more effective and efficient. And that hopefully, you know, will sustain the uh, outcomes beyond a set of uh, funders who really bring in a very small amount of capital when we look at the, uh, the larger, you know, problem that we are trying to solve. So I think that's the near term solution that could happen. And uh, I'm also very positive that it will happen based on some of the conversations that we are having. Good. Thank you for answering that. Thanks, Aparna. Thanks, Karthik. I'm sorry I have to pop out uh, earlier, but I will connect with you to take up some of the questions offline. Thank you very much, Rachel. So, folks, we've got, I think, over 30 questions. Uh, so, I'm not sure if we can get through all of them, but we have about 15 minutes. So, Aparna, uh, how should we do this? Should we maybe club them by speaker or by topic? I'm trying to club them by topic, but uh, perhaps... Um... Abha, we can get you started. There's a question about, uh, you know, evaluation costs. This is always sort of the elephant in the room. Uh, so maybe if you can, you know, provide some perspective on that, um, you know, obviously people are concerned that evaluation costs are high. How do those get addressed, um, you know, going forward? How do we keep those at a minimum? Yeah, and let me just add to that. And this is a question, I guess, uh, for both Abha and, and Dan, right? Which is the, the, the reducing the timeline and reducing the cost right? That there have been X number of dibs. There's so much interest on this call and in the industry to do more. And of course, there's larger fundamental issues about fundraising, pricing, and so forth. But if we just focus on this issue, which many people are skeptical about, and they say, look, guys, the cost to set up a dib is so high and the time takes so long. Where are we on that? Is that going to dramatically come down or is it still going to be cumbersome to launch more dibs? I can, I can have a first go and I'm sure Dhan will add, uh, add some excellent points as well. Uh, on timeline, it's um, as an organization, we're personally committed to reducing timelines on this. And the way we see it and from our learning is to do several bits of the work together. There are three or four streams of work that are required for a dip to be set up. The fundraising, design, and the legals are the three main streams that we do collect. We do them parallelly as against you know, sequence-wise as we used to do them previously. So one of our big learnings is to do that together, reduce the timeline on some of the setup. So I genuinely believe with scale and time and learning that's there in the market, the timelines are going down. I mean, we see them most obviously. And if anything, COVID is actually enabling our timelines to reduce. We recently, uh, we, we, on our transaction that we're on currently, we have a two-month timeline and our donors are saying, can you do it faster? And I thought, gosh, there was a time when dibs were taking six months uh, or to a year. So even from the times when we started the education dip to now, uh, it's a very different timeline. So I don't think timelines need to stretch if the transaction is put, meeting the right problem and for the right solution. I think the problem with some dibs is it's applied to the wrong issues. And I think that it, therein lies the problem. A dib doesn't apply for every single problem. That's a one. On evaluation costs, it's a factor of transaction. So if it's a $10 million dip and the evaluation cost is you know, 5%, 3% or 2% of it, I think that's perfectly reasonable. It's when you have an evaluation cost on a very small transaction, that's when the economics don't work. The early dibs were R&D dibs and they needed that. But by the time you come to our dib, we don't think the evaluation costs are high at all and neither does anybody else. So I think it's a factor of, of size and we have a sort of golden rule that we don't do small dibs and we actually work at scale and, and then and others actually working at even bigger scale than that. So the way the market is going, evaluation doesn't have to cost a lot if you're working with several part partners at scale and using a structure that can be applied to several partners. So both those impediments actually as a market, they're being, they're being addressed and actually executed uh, as well. Dhan, you want to add anything to that? I guess just a couple of quick points, completely agree with Abha, and it is really, it's about a scale question. So as you do move to these pooled funds, um, you will actually leverage wider architecture on contracting, evaluation, verification um, for a wider, for, for a larger number of uh, 
separate transaction. So costs will go down per transaction. Um, also developing local capabilities. So as we invest in uh, you know, building capacity, uh, uh, helping smaller organizations to come up and, and, and play the role in, in assessment, in verification. Uh, and, and I think moving from assessment, which was you know, really required, uh, a rigorous assessment required to develop evidence base with early transactions uh, to verification processes, which are less, uh, are low cost. And then using innovation and technology to explore how we can drive down further. So for example, uh, we are piloting um, the application of blockchain to see how can the overall trans contracting cost as well as verification cost be taken down in Hong Kong. I know Aparna, you have more questions, but but uh, one more uh, that I saw, which was things relating to to COVID, right? Uh, specifically, this force majeure risk, right? And the NGOs who are out there on the ground delivering X work now because of COVID is locked down, they can't do it anymore. So so I guess two questions for the existing dibs: Were there have, have those dibs been impacted? And uh, people's operations uh, Im impacted, and who who takes on who pays for that risk? That's that's really the question. And can these be built into contracts? So how do we deal with force majeure risks like COVID? Karthik, I'll take and I'm sorry you uh, actually asked that uh, asked me that question earlier, and I, and I and I missed addressing it. Uh, so I think in terms of force majeure, this is definitely something that in most contracts is already looked at. So there usually is a force majeure clause. Uh, and uh, at the time of design of a contract, uh, you are usually pricing um, for factors excluding force measure scenarios. So your pricing estimations do not factor this in, but your clauses would typically look, look like, um, you know, parties need to, uh, need to uh, engage in discussion and, and come to an agreement in the case of um, uh, scenarios like flood or, or COVID, etc. So I think in, you know, that is how it is currently structured in most contracts. And I think that is the right approach because it is very hard to forecast or to, to price risk into that. And so it becomes then a matter of discussion, negotiation, and uh, determining, you know, what amount of risk uh, investors, funders, etc. Are, are willing to bear and, and coming to an agreement on that at the time. I'll add a couple of things, Karthik, uh, on this. Um, in the, we sit within some of the learning groups on this at the Government Outcomes Lab. Uh, overall, people aren't applying force majeure clauses uh, globally. Uh, given the severity of COVID, I think the general, the general recourse has been to discussion and collaborative approaches on it, including on our own education bib. Nobody has turned to saying, either the investors haven't turned the tap off or neither have the outcome funders. We understand this to be a risk as none ever before. And therefore, the idea of force measure being applied, I can see for a flood or for something which is a minimal, small issue uh, to a certain provider within the contract, but not at the scale that the world is facing currently. So that's the practicality of it. Two is the, what happens if you don't apply force measure? Let's look at the reality of it. And there's a spectrum of solutions we are looking at. If the outcomes that you work on still matter, children still need to learn. And, we, you know, and in the case of our dip, there's no question. Children have to continue to learn. If the focus on outcomes has to continue, the, the group has to agree what degree, what has to change. Do we, for example, reduce the targets that the children have to meet? Or do we change the cost ratios around some of that? Alternatively, do we temporarily move to a pay-for-service model and then switch back to a pay-for-outcomes model? There is a whole continuum of decision-making which we've agreed first principles on as a group. And most impact bonds are doing that. The excellent thing about a dip is you don't have to go back and renegotiate a contract with a service provider as to what they're doing in the classroom. Tomorrow they can move from training in a certain way and, and move to a completely different model. All the instrument has to do is at the instrument level, agree those principles, change the few parameters that are required in the case of, of crisis and move on. And I think that's actually one of the big strengths of this instrument. If we can make that evidence come out in public domain after this is to pass, the, um, so therefore, the, the use has, there hasn't been a force majeure kind of conversation with most impact bonds is, is the answer. But there are many interesting solutions that lie between that and the reality that was before. And let's end with a, 
difficult perhaps question, but, a, but an important one, which is the challenges that, okay. that this instrument or this industry faces. Important to discuss, right? We've talked a lot about the potential and that, that was the point of this discussion and, and, and the perspectives of the funders. And I think it's been a fairly balanced discussion, but maybe it'll be useful, right? Since we have a lot of questions have come up, uh, which we've not been able to cover specific questions, critical questions, and, 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 you know, for example, if you're pricing impact, how do you ensure salaries aren't lowered and all kinds of issues, uh, which I'm sorry uh, to the folks on the session, we weren't able to cover all of these questions, but we will definitely uh, continue the dialogue. But perhaps we can end by saying, talking about what do both of you feel are the two or three biggest challenges in this space that all of us collectively as an industry should be working on. You know, what, what worries you? about uh, the next six to nine months. And that can be related to COVID also, but, 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 but broadly, you know, what could go wrong as we try to mobilize and then launch additional dibs in India specifically? Dan, do you want to go first? Or? Sure, yeah, happy to, uh, to go first. I think, uh, Karthik, there are challenges and there are opportunities, but I think mainly if you ask me what, what concerns me most, is uh, you know the, the challenge of how do you um, enable wider participation um, in transactions like this to really the small mid-sized organizations to also be able to benefit from this and that's where a lot of capacity building um, um, effort needs to be um, focused so really that the pipeline challenges of um, um, that, that, that come in uh, I think that's the, the biggest and then I would say secondly and this has been a challenge as well as I think a great and positive experience has been the multi-stakeholder um, partnership, mm. uh, but it is, it, it, you know, they do uh, require uh, convening um, uh, many um, or bringing together many different stakeholders, reaching alignment and agreement on what are the right outcomes, what are the right benchmarks. Um, and so um, it can be challenging if, not navigated correctly, uh, and we have we've you know we we've, we've heard from many who are stuck in design phase that that's kind of where um, you know where things don't move sometimes. Uh, but it's also like I said earlier, a great opportunity for actually funders to be coming together on something. So um, I'd say those are the two. two you, Abha, you don't see funding as a challenge, right? It, no, as, not as, us. PSR. <laughs> Uh, the potential of corporates to put more money into this out because people have said in the past outcome funding is not always available. Risk capital, presumably you can unlock mm -hmm. if people get some return for it. So you don't see that as a challenge or any other challenges that you want to add to that? Uh, so yes, I'll add a couple of challenges. One is, uh, and first I agree with Dhan, I just want to say that, um, I always say that, I always agree with my investors and then we have the fights uh, later, don't we Dhan? Um, so uh, so the, the first thing I'd say is, uh, my biggest challenge is the efficient use of a tool which has a legacy of being slow, being thought of as being slow and complicated in a time where, where, where agility is the answer. How do we make the tool agile in the context we're in? I am absolutely determined to be part of that answer and show that agility is possible with the tool in the sector. Uh, if, we do, if we don't use this opportunity to do that, as some of the practitioners, we'll be doing the sector a disservice. Let's kill the transaction question, time question. Let's kill the cost question during COVID. Let's move quickly. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do. And that is a challenge for me. I want to kill that challenge. The second challenge is why use an impact bond when grant can do getting recovery, you know, grant can do the work better. It's a challenge I ask myself on every single transaction. Can I use grant on this or not? And only when I can answer that challenge for myself do I use an impact bond? Because if we can't use, if we, grant is king in my, in my world, in the philanthropic world. And when grant stops being king is when an impact bond comes in uh, and trumps it. And that's the, that's the answer, that challenge doesn't go away for us. Do not use an impact bond when it's not required. And that's when I think that's when transactions fail as well, because donors don't buy into things that they know can be done through straightforward grants. They're not stupid to go and buy a convoluted thing. The convoluted thing should be there for an exam, for a real reason that you want an outcome to happen that is not happening otherwise. That's the second challenge. And the final one is one of government. I think really governments need to come on board on this. If they start buying outcomes and they're able to change the regulatory environment in a way they understand how they can procure outcomes, they're used to procuring inputs, we can really have transformative change. And that is really the big cheese in this, uh, in this discussion. As I'm speaking, it's getting dark in London. So suddenly my room's gone all dark. Sorry. I just know, yes, I've just yeah. noticed. Thunderstorm here in Delhi. I don't know if you the can. Thunderstorm in Delhi, London's always like this, lucky me. 
Um, so, uh, so that's from my side. I, I can go on, but the most important thing, the things I've told you, and, and I've, I've yeah. done such a lot. No, no, thank, uh, thank you to both of you, uh, and uh, uh, to Prachi as well, who, who's, who's uh, no longer on the call. And it's exactly 6 p.m. So, as uh, promised, we will sign off exactly at six. Uh, uh, to stay on time, and I hope you guys will join the rest of the sessions. And I think there's a plenary session with uh, Mr. Kailash Satyarthi at seven. So thank you all very much. Uh, this was a panel discussion uh, discussion with leading funders and intermediaries who have really pioneered the impact bond market in India and globally. So thank you to all of you for sharing your insights on the existing models, uh, focus on education and spilling, uh, skilling, uh, and what structures are most relevant for a post-COVID world. How do not profits need to scale these models? and perspectives on how additional risk capital and outcome funding can be mobilized. Uh, and thank you, Shiram, uh, who is the host of our panel, and uh, uh, to everyone at Asha Impact team for organizing this. So thank you thank very you much. Abba. Thank you, Abba. Thank you, Thank you, Dan, for coming at really short notice and helping us all with this. Thank you.